are again. Welcome back, everybody. This is DDP with the Dallas Prospect talking about the Mavericks 124 to 118 victory over the Charlotte Hornets last night. I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit skeptical early on in that game. The defense really had me hurting and I was kind of worried. Boy, is this team a little bit more fraudulent than we want to give it credit for? That, that's a bit extreme, but I think that Nuggets game really humbled us a little bit. Yeah, it ended up being an 11-point defeat, but you saw really, I think, the the difference between those two teams there. And so you kind of wondered, like, you hadn't played a lot of strong teams, obviously, yet. So what could we really expect? Well... The answer, I think, in the second half showed itself a little bit better last night. Still jury out, but all the same. There was a lot to like about last night's performance. Not so much with the first half defense, but with a lot of standout performances and cohesively what we saw defensively in the second half. Now let's talk first about Derek Lively. Why? Maybe because being a fellow Derek, I'm a little bit biased. I don't know. Lively was phenomenal last night. 15 points, 14 rebounds, 7 of 9 from the field. I uh, also had three offensive rebounds, too. And a huge, huge block in the fourth quarter there uh, as Dallas was kind of rallying to overcome a sluggish start. And, you know, Bell or Bell Ball made a lot of really impressive plays there for Charlotte. Uh, made it tough on Dallas every time Dallas tried to fight back and rally, they would just kind of respond. And it was dropping threes. It was just anything that you would normally think would just gut a team defensively and kind of put them back. So for Lively to come up with a huge block in the midst of all that, I thought was huge. Uh, another note here, Lively in last night's performance now qualifies with nine field goal attempts. For the season now, you have to have X amount of field goal attempts overall to qualify for the the – field goal percentage leaders among the league. And it's more like your shot attempts per game, per minutes played, all that. And so with that performance last night, he now qualifies for the NBA field goal percentage leaders and ranks second behind Charlotte's own Mark Williams. What's his field goal percentage on the young season? 77.4%. I'll take that. And I mentioned earlier his huge block. Again, his defensive presence, um, I think huge for Dallas's five and one start here. But, you know, I wanted to, to call this out specifically. Um, Mavs Film Room had a, a good stat here coming into the game. Now, granted, he cites field goal percentage again until after the game's um, showing last night. He didn't technically qualify for this. But coming into the game, Lively was fourth in total dunks, second in field goal percentage, again, unofficially at the time. Um, fourth in effective field goal percentage, second among rookies in plus minus, and second among rookies in rebounds per game. Considering Chet Holgram and uh, Wimby are in that, Wimby Yamba, yeah, you're going you're gonna to take that. You're going to take that, performing on the level of those two guys. So really impressive stuff here from him. You know, it's funny to me because there were people, including in my comment sections of some of these videos where I've talked about Lively, who insisted because he was nothing superstar quality looking at Duke because they didn't see that. They just saw like, hey, yeah, he was the second or depending on what recruiting polls you looked at, the top recruit coming out of high school. Because they didn't see it translate at Duke, they insisted that it was blasphemy to already be talking about him as a real and immediate difference maker for this Mavericks team. Never mind the fact that he was going to be playing with two generational hall of fame caliber point guards who have such gravity to them and who are such phenomenal passers and orchestrators of an offense that they were going to get him all kinds of great easy looks easy lobs easy finishes around the rim and that they were just going to feed this dude well his ability with his size athleticism and feel with those guys on his team was always going to be a recipe for success health permitting lively is showing out in a big way here. Like, again, it, it was hilarious to me, the people who insisted like, oh, why would you think that? He wasn't anything great at Duke. This is just hype with no substance. No, no, you just have no vision. That's the problem. Lively looks like he is that dude for the Maverick. So uh, all things Mavs had a really good, supporting this as well, had a really good uh, um, preview here for this. 
You want to look at it this way through six games at Duke lively had 19 points on nine made baskets and 18 rebounds through six games. That's what he had. So yeah, nothing, nothing substantial. He found it hard to get minutes in that front court at Duke. However, in six games with the Mavericks lively has 53 points on 24 made baskets and 49 rebounds. Yeah. I'm going to say the dude's finding, finding his rhythm and earning his keep here. It's night and day. You cannot compare the two just because a guy wasn't successful in college. Wasn't a, like, wasn't just a superstar looking player, even though the measurables were there, the physical traits were there just because he didn't put up big numbers in college does not mean he will amount to nothing in the pros. That is a hilariously short-sighted um, vision and perspective in my opinion. So lively. Yeah, he's good. He looks like exactly what I thought he was going to be for this team. When I started actually looking into him, um, after the draft, when they got him, I was like, I don't know much about the guy, but I'm going to start looking into him. Cause there, there are some people saying like, this is a real get. And as soon as I started looking, I was like, yeah, this, this could be huge. So love what I'm seeing from the kid early on. Now let's talk about the Mavericks in the, in crunch time in the clutch here. Last season, the Mavericks were 26 and 29 in clutch games. Um, for those wondering, a game that is considered a clutch game is a game within five or fewer points uh, in the final five minutes of regulation. So obviously, if you go to OT, it's automatically going to qualify, regardless of what happens there. Um, five, final five minutes of the game and a score within five points. That qualifies as a clutch game. The Mavericks are 5-0 and oh this season in such games. What does that tell us? Aside from the fact that they are closing well and they, um, you know, struggled with that last year, they seem to be certainly predisposed to playing crunch time games because they can't really avoid it. The only time they haven't had a game that was in the clutch was the one loss on the year. They lost by 11 points against Denver for the first game of the play, uh, in season tournament. I almost said play in tournament. No, it's the in season tournament, which the whole mechanics of that are still bizarre to me, but. I digress. So five out of six games have been clutch games. You're five and zero oh in those games. That's not necessarily a good thing. Now hear me out. It's good that you are closing out these games and you are building that resilience. But the fact that you seem predisposed to having those games, even though you haven't played necessarily a super strong strength of schedule yet, that's the concern. That's not sustainable. In the microcosm, yes, you feel great knowing your guys are, you know, learning how to play and finish how to uh, succeed through playing in these high adversity moments and environments. That's great. But you can't play a million clutch games. Eventually, it catches up to you. If you're playing a bad team, you need to put that away and win by double digits or not have to play as hard and play your guys your big time players, heavy minutes. That's what I'm saying will catch up to you. If you have to have a million of these games, even if your record is good, that mileage will catch up with you down the road. That is the main point I'm trying to make. And to piggyback on uh, another element here where we could see an impact, Dalton Trigg points out that last season, the Mavericks were three and 10 on the second night of back-to-backs. Well, tonight the Mavericks have their first back to back they're now going to play in orlando and uh you know regardless of that five and one start and the experience of that you shouldn't sleep on orlando not just because again three and ten last year and uh the second night of back-to-backs but orlando's not a pushover like they they've got something nice there they're they're more than capable so we're going to have a new test this year the one really good team we went against kind of knocked our teeth down our throat stood up a little bit but you know, there, there's a clear difference there between your Denver and your Dallas. Now we're going to see how Dallas is in a more challenging situation. And if you had been able to take care of your business against the Hornets a little bit better, at least not have to rely on a clutch time performance, not have the slow start that made you have to dig and dig and dig to climb out of the hole. You'd probably feel a little bit better in this road environment going to Orlando, even with Orlando being a pretty good team. Take nothing for granted but I do think that is a, a chance to come up and bite them tonight um, playing in that situation. We'll get into that. Uh, Hardy. Hardy finally gets some good minutes playing with Luca and Kyrie. And uh, he's basically surpassed 
Seth Curry at this point in the rotation. And I feel like that's frankly something that should have been entering the year. Uh, duh for Dallas. I think Hardy absolutely earned it just off of last year's performance. Again, I like Seth Curry. I do. I'm glad he's back on the team. I'm cool with having him on the bench as a, a veteran that you can bring in and do that thing. But like, he's always been sort of the one trick pony <laughs> and it's a damn good trick, but it's not enough that you can like put him in there and play him heavy minutes uh, rotationally, especially when you get a guy like Hardy, who's already here and can do so much more than him already. Now, yes, I understand Hardy late in camp, turned it ankle, missed the last preseason game. They kind of brought him back a little bit slowly along. Didn't rush him back. That's why he didn't play the first couple games, apparently. But even still, I mean, you just see the impact this guy has. And I'm not just talking about the, the thunderous poster dunk last night as well, although that was really nice. Um, really nice to see that. But the guy is just instant offense. He plays 15 minutes. He has 14 points. And what I really like is his ability to get to the line and convert. He netted seven of his eight free throw attempts. I love that. Not just the fact that, yeah, he's going to look for his shot. Yeah, he's going to take some threes and he's going to try and create for himself. He will also get to the line. He's not just going to try and dance away from uh, dance away to create some space from the defender and then pull up and shoot a, a fadeaway or a pull-up jumper or a three-pointer or whatever. He'll get into the teeth of it. You know, obviously the dunk shows you that too, but he'll get into the teeth of the defense and he'll try to make some things happen. He'll draw contact, he'll get to the line and he'll convert it. That's just good fundamental basketball. So I love to see that. And I love to see that he was getting some big fourth quarter minutes there and uh, doing a little something, something with it too. So love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, Hardy on one foot, even, even if, even if he's largely a decoy, who's a spot up shooter, I think it's comparable enough or better than what Curry can give you in the best case hopeful scenario here. So yeah, I go with that every time, every time. Glad he's finally finding his uh, rhythm here, his place in this rotation, and I think his minutes need to keep, maybe not ticking up, 15 is a good number, but I want to see um, you know a little bit of consistency with that and allow him to run with some of these units with Luca and Kyrie uh, as well. Keep building on that is what I want. Now let's talk about the Mavericks defensive ratings. I, for, I foreshadowed this a little bit earlier, but it's becoming a trend we can't ignore at this point. We saw this literally opening night for the Mavericks against the Spurs. Defensive ratings uh, are fun. Um, this team, you know, the eyeball test alone will tell you that this team struggles with its first half defense, but it does do a significantly better job in the second half. Uh, Nick Engstadt on Twitter points out that Dallas uh, last night had a defensive rating of 114.6. That would be 22nd overall in the league. In the first half, however, Dallas's defensive rating was an abysmal 121.7, which would be 30th in the league. They did tighten up after the half, like we talked about. The second half defensive uh, rating was 107.6. That would be the eighth best defensive rating in the league. So, you see tale of two halves here, but when you look quarter by quarter, you kind of see a trend for this team. Now, fourth quarter is always going to be a little bit more. So just because you see the fourth quarter tick up slightly from what the third quarter defense is, don't put much stock in that. There's more desperation from the other team. So you're going to have a harder time holding them down as much as you do in the third quarter. Plus a little bit of rest, a little bit of rest rust, if you will, coming off of halftime. Guys are trying to get back acclimated a little bit. But Dallas quarter by quarter this year, their first quarter defensive rating is garbage, 128.6. That's 28th in the league. Second quarter is 114.7. That's 22nd in the league. Third quarter is where it gets much better, 105.8. That is the 11th best in the league. And the fourth quarter, 109.5, is also the 11th best defensive rating in the league. So quarter by quarter, you see... The first half is really where this team is putting itself into some challenges, and I think that's why they can't get out of their way with these clutch games and having to come down to the wire here a little bit every single game because they just put themselves you know, into, into a little bit of a hole that they have to work out of. They have to find a way to navigate these situations. Like in the case of last night, you're, you're trying to dig out of this hole against the Hornets, and I don't think it's a game that ever needed to be there. You know, like you get stellar, stellar three-point shooting from Grant in particular. Uh, how many threes did Grant have on the night? Let me check this here. Grant had 
four out of five on threes, but he was seven of nine from the field. It felt like all of those threes were in the fourth quarter. Like it, it felt so huge the way he was coming up and making plays. His defense is great. His leadership and versatility is great. Luca and Kyrie both credit him significantly. And that's awesome. That's where you want to see those adjustments come into play. But here's, here's the main thing I want to point out. The effort is better defensively this year. Like last year, the whole season seemed to be a problem with effort, with rotation, with assignments. And we were talking all year last year um, about Luca and frustration with his defensive effort. Part of that was coming into camp out of shape. I get that. But also part of it was just effort on the defensive end. And I feel like there's more accountability, more you know, quality communication among these guys, more respect and more effort and heart. And so while we look at the first half defensive rating and we say that is not at all acceptable and we look at the second half and we say that's much better. Why can't we do that the whole game? It's hard to play at that same level for the entire game. Like it just is. But the first half defensive rating is not indicative of, of this team's quality. I don't think I think they are much better. I think they're going to keep trending in the right direction because I mentioned Grant, I've mentioned lively before and his kind of quarterbacking the defense from that anchor spot. Really even Luca and Kyrie deserve a lot of credit for their defense this year. People, some people are freaking out about Kyrie. This almost goes into an extra bonus point. Some people are kind of freaking out about Kyrie a little bit right now in terms of the offensive side, but the way he's pacing and controlling uh, the offense with this team, the way that he's playmaking for other guys, the defense that he's actually playing for, it's really making a huge difference. The offensive game is a little slow right now for Kyrie. He still had 18 and 10 uh, in 34 minutes, six of 14 from the field, two of six from three. I get why some people are a little bit concerned with that, but at the same time, he's doing what you want. He's your secondary guy in a way that he didn't ever look like he was willing to necessarily defer entirely to KD in Brooklyn. He seems to be willing to do that with Luca here. He's accepting, hey, I'm not saying I'm either A, I'm either one or one A. I'll accept I'm the second guy here. I accept that. I embrace that. And I'm going to be the, the distributor, the guy who can help orchestrate things so that it's not all on Luca. I'm going to be the guy who can create and just with my insane shiftiness and handles and everything like that, my vision, help create and set up these other guys. And yes, I'm going to eventually find my rhythm here. And I'm going to start to put up big buckets and big games for this team as well. Early on, it's not there. Not, not like we know Kyrie to be there. It will get there. But on the meantime, as, as we talk to this bigger point I've been talking about of the defensive rating, I love that even he's in on that effort um, and seems like he's giving full commitment, full heart behind this. That's why I think this team's defensive ratings as lopsided as they are now, one extreme to the other. I think they are better than this. I think part of it's just going to come together with a little bit of time. And as the season goes on, they'll build a cohesiveness that you'll see that trend. Again, I think this is a kind of middle of the road defense overall, but that's okay right now. With your offensive rating, that's really all you need. We talked last video about how the Mavericks offensive rating is like top five. And then their net rating is still top 10 because the offense is so good. It makes up for the defense being kind of lackluster overall. I think 22nd was where I had it before. Um, now, granted, that was before the Denver game even. But, um, you know, I, I look at all that and I say this team is going to be better than what we see. I get that they're winning a lot of clutch time games here. I feel like they shouldn't have had that. But at the end of the day, they are 5-1 uh, and one on the season. And they are sitting currently at second in the West. They were first technically before Denver handed them their lunch money back. Actually, they didn't hand the lunch money back. They took it away. Uh, but they're sitting second in the West right now. And uh, that's pretty cool. Five and one. It's been a while since we've had that kind of start. Enjoy it while we got it. Let's hope that this team can keep building and keep improving as that defense gets better. Maybe they will stand better toe to toe with some of these great teams in the West. But right now, there's a lot to be happy about. There's a lot to smile about looking at this Mavericks team, even if we did have the one disappointment. So I'm all optimism right now. I'm not trying to beat Denver at this time of year. Would I like to? Sure, absolutely. But my whole thing is I didn't really have many expectations that that would happen. The whole point is 
you try to get better, you try to improve so that if you find them later on in your path, AKA the playoffs, you're ready and you can maybe go at them then. If you want to look at a baseball thing, the Astros smacked the Rangers like nine out of 14 games in the regular season this year. And then they got to the ALCS and the Rangers beat them in seven, but they beat them all four games in Houston. Like it, it, it was a game or a series that people were saying was going to be a sweep. And instead the Rangers, hell, they had to choke away a game at home. They would have beaten them in six, but it, the Rangers kind of owned it. Like they, they really handled their business. And it's like, where did this come from? The regular season didn't tell us this was what these two teams looked like or how they would compete with one another. You want to be in a similar situation if you can. Again, apples to oranges, but uh, I'm I'm optimistic in the long run of what this team can do if they stay healthy and if they keep trending in the direction they're they're moving. The defense is better, the parts are better, um, and you know the the evolution of these guys is just going to be that much better in the long run. If you don't have to put as much usage on Luca, if you're able to balance Kyrie um, in that secondary role a little bit there, keep him healthy. And you're able to bring along the young talent that you have. Not saying it's like, oh, all, all, you know, thrusters go, we're going for it now. But you're in a good position moving forward. And that's what's exciting to me. But what do you think? How do you feel about the Mavericks five and one start? How do you feel about them beating Charlotte by six last night? Was it six or was it four? Uh, yeah, six points last night in a game that probably should have been more comfortable, but is what it is. Let me know in the comments, like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!